A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. So in mid-August, uh, Fortnite created an, a new imposters mode, which was essentially the entire game of Among Us. Uh, like Among Us, 10 players were involved in two teams, one of which has two imposters in it, and they even called them uh, what the Among Us did, so they call them uh, imposters. Uh, Fortnite's version of Among Us was polished, but it was completely innovative, copy of Among Us as far as I could tell, and it just had kind of this little bit of Fortnite uh, window dressing. And to me, that seemed crazy. Right? The team at Innerslot that made Among Us created something original that connected with audiences, and they should be able to collect from their ideas. If another company just took their idea and copied it, well, it both disregarded what Innerslot deserved for their creative efforts, and it would make it far less likely that similar companies would bother coming up with unique original ideas. So I immediately wanted to do an episode on the topic, but Andy had a completely different take on it. He said that everyone borrowed or, you know, took ideas from everyone else, right? At the end of the day, it was all about how you put those ideas together. Uh, Among Us itself was a, a copy of the tabletop social de deduction genre, games like Werewolf and Mafia. Uh, and there was nothing really wrong with taking someone else's ideas and using them in this way. Um, we decided that this really needed a deeper inquiry into the ethics of intellectual property in games. And uh, finally, we remembered that Jose Zagal uh, teaches uh, about IP in his video games and ethics course. So we reached out to him to see if he can walk us through this topic. Um, what we came up with is a fun turnaround where Jose will be our very first guest host uh, and lead us in this conversation about the morality of IP in games. Um, Jose Zagal, uh, once again, uh, is a professor at the University of Utah's top-ranked uh, game development program. He teaches a variety of classes, including game design and ethics in video games. Uh, he's um, also a games academic who publishes research papers analyzing and theorizing about games, uh, including, of course, the intersection and overlap of ethics in video games. Uh, he was honored as a Distinguished Game Scholar by the Digital Games Research Association and as a fellow by the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. You can follow him on Twitter at Jose Zagal. Um, and you can also listen to our episode with him about teaching ethics of video games, uh, our milestone episode 20. Uh, Jose Zagal, welcome to the podcast. Please take over. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It is super exciting to be here uh, with you guys again. I think we had a really fun conversation last time around, and I yeah. hope that it will be the same this time around. Yeah, so I think the, the the Fortnite example is a really good one to bring up, right? A lot of people will fall on both sides of that coin, basically outrage on the one hand, uh, like, oh my God, they totally ripped off this idea. It's a, it's a concept that these guys put together. It's a story of sort of the David and, and the Goliath. You know, Fortnite is the Goliath in this case, David being the Among Us. Um, but on the, other side, on the other hand, I think we need to sort of also recognize that um, there are really very few new ideas under the sun and that games have changed and developed over the years by being able to exactly tap into this, this I'm going to call this giant melting pot of, of game concepts, right? Um, and we can think of an alternate present, I guess, if the, if back in the past, if there had been different legislation around intellectual property where someone could say, yeah, you know, uh, we invented jumping in video games. And so this concept of jumping has, is belongs to this company and they get to own it and they get to, if you know, maximize profits by licensing, licensing that idea out to different companies and, and so on. And you, may, you can imagine how the trajectory of, of games would be very different if someone could you know, have some sort of ownership of, a, let's say, jumping or shooting or moving, in, you know, something on the screen, uh, having points, having score, stuff like that. And so, that's that's the that's the some of the complexity where, or that's the there's a, a line there that um, I'm going to say legislation is generally trying to to uh, to stick to, right? To sort of stick between these these two needs, right? The desire to allow people to innovate and create things while also um, wanting to encourage innovation. So I thought we could talk a little bit about intellectual property and sort of roll back 
the, the mists of time and, and ask ourselves a, a basic question, which is, why do we even have intellectual property uh, to start? And I say, why do we even have it? Because intellectual property is a legal concept. It's, it's not a natural thing that exists out there. It's something that human beings in society decided to create, to invent. Like, you know what? We're going to invent this idea of a thing called intellectual property. Um, and so the question was, well, why? Why was that? So I, I thought I'd ask you guys, what, what, why do you think? Why, why did we come up with this idea a couple hundred years ago? I feel like, like the idea that an idea is belongs to somebody, the first person that comes up with an idea sort of feels like they have ownership of it, right? There's sort of a fairness aspect to this. Partly, I think, you know, Andy's right, right? There's the fairness aspect of it. But then there's also this kind of question of, of, of uh, utilitarian uh, aspect of things, right? Uh, is there a way we can incentivize uh, people to come up with new ideas? Uh, if we protect them, right, will that essentially get people to come up with new ideas? Uh, they'll make money from, from it and the rest of society will benefit from it. Okay, oh, that's super interesting because you're, you're both bringing up the, the two most, I would say, the, the sort of the common reasons. Um, in, the, in the context of the United States, if you read the Constitution, it basically says, uh, what 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 uh, Soma was describing, um, and he says that gives Congress the power to secure for limited times, um, basically to give the inventor of something uh, a monopoly over that thing that they invented, right? And in the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, it basically says it explicitly for reasons of encouraging uh, innovation. So this goes to the the idea that hey. Um, we recognize that inventing something, like if someone invents a new kind of a wheel, let's imagine that up, up to this day, we've only had square wheels. And square wheels are really annoying. They're kind of slow and they don't spin very well. And someone comes along and says, you know what? Um, I like that square wheel, but you know, I think I could do better. And so someone invents a pentagonal wheel, right? It's got five sides instead of four. So it actually rolls a little bit better. Um, and so, we, we society cannot benefit from this new kind of wheel. And so how do we encourage people to invent things, to create things that will improve society, um, while also recognizing that once something's invented, it's really it's usually a lot cheaper for someone else to just copy that, right? It's a lot harder for me to write a novel than for someone to like churn out 50 copies of that novel if they have a printing press. And so the desire there in, in, in the constitution, like it's, it's enshrined, you can go read it. Uh, the U.S. Constitution specifically, it basically says, yeah, you know, we want society to be better off. And we recognize that society is better off when uh, when people invent new things. And so to incentivize people to invent new things, we will give those people the right to profit of those things for a limited amount of time. Um, so what I want to point out here, which I think is interesting, is that the default assumption is that the inventions of the mind are not inventions that you, like, you're not entitled to those things. The assumption is, if you invented a story, like that story doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to everybody, um, which is not the default assumption people have nowadays. Right? Right. Nowadays, we're very much, I wrote this story, so it belongs to me. And I, by, by, by nature, it belongs to me. And, and, and that's like the fundamental way things should be. So can I, can I ask about, because um, I'm, I'm thinking about children and thinking mm -hmm. about how even, even young children will, will become agitated if they feel like something that they thought of is being is being claimed by somebody else mm -hmm. and so they're clearly i mean is it just so part of our culture that that we just ingrain that in children so quickly or is it something is it is is that sort of fairness a deeper thing i think i think most of it is culture and the, the thing to keep in mind is and this is it, it's really hard for us to wrap our head around this and i say us in you know, this day and age is that for the, the majority of human existence and society, culture was something that everybody owned. Um, and we think of this, the, the oral storytelling, and that's how our culture spread and, and was maintained, it's sort of oral traditions of storytelling and music and so on. And so in that sense, it's not that I invented the story, it's rather, well, I, it becomes mine in the extent that I have my way of telling it, for example. Mm -hmm. right? And that's, you know, thousands and thousands of years of, of human culture and existence. And it is only until very recently, specifically with the invention of intellectual property, that we started to sort of enshrine or, or like 
assign ownership and rights to that ownership to, to specific people. I mean, even in the case of the U.S. Constitution, it's like, yeah, the default assumption that, yeah, you don't own your ideas. Ideas are not things that people own, but we're going to make an exception. We're going to make an exception here right. and give you, you know, a certain amount of time where you can profit from your ideas. And we're only doing that for society. We're not doing that for you. We're not doing that because we think you deserve to make money off your idea. The you make money off your ideas just is literally an incentive. Yeah, so we should think of copyright as a cost. Right? It's something, it's a it's a limit on our freedom that we are willing to accept because we think overall it benefits society. Um, it's a very social contract theory sort of idea, right? This idea that we want to benefit from being society. And so we, we're going to subject ourselves to this extra limitation, right? Um, I'm, I'm okay with, you know, having to go to the DMV to get a driver's license because I think that makes like driving on the road safer for everybody and I feel more more comfortable. So, sure, I will go through that paperwork and I will carry around this card and I'll have to renew it every some number of years. Right? So, corporate is something is like that. Um, but a lot of people have argued that we recognize that um, any single creative innovation comes from some place else. You're always inspired by something. You're always modifying something that already existed. You're adding something new, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so copyright is, a lot of people argue, is, is unethical because why should the last person, like that, that last, the end of the chain of, of innovation be the one to get all the rewards, right? Um, sure, you invented that pentagonal wheel, but hey, what about the person that invented the, the square wheel and the person that before had that, you know, whatever it was, you're always building off of something else, right? Um, and and so in that sense, why should you have some sort of natural right to own this idea when your idea was influenced and based on and modified and improved someone else's? Right? And this is in the, in the good case, right? Maybe your idea does not improve mm -hmm. and it's worse, but why should you be the one to like lock it down? Um, <laughs> let's bring this back to games. So, yes, please. Mm -hmm. In the concept of games, um, so there are lots of different forms of, of, of intellectual property. The three main ones that matter for games are copyright, patents, and trademarks, right? Um, so the trademark is perhaps the, the simplest to think about. It's just, it's a symbol or a marking that you use to designate your trade. So it's like company logos, for example, right? When you see like registered trademark, that's like, yeah, Nintendo has a logo. This is a logo under which they do business. So that has that protection. So as long as, this, as Nintendo continues to, uh, to practice the trade for which they got that mark, they're entitled to use that mark. Um, and trademark is interesting because you can get it's very um, industry specific, right? That's why we have Apple Music mm -hmm. and Apple Computers, um, and you can have uh, there's lots of things like different companies that have the same name, but if they're in different industries, that's okay. The idea is that a consumer will understand that you know in this context, this company is in this industry, and so I won't get confused with the same name in another industry, right? Uh, so copyright in games. Uh, is mostly to protect things like stories and characters and designs. So I like to think of this as music, artwork, like uh, scripts, uh, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, patents, though, are a different form of, of intellectual property, and they're there to protect inventions, essentially. Okay. Uh, so there are things such as software patents, where you can get a patent for... Well, obviously, in the case of video games, there's you get patents for... Your hardware and the innovations that you might have in your hardware. I mean, think of like there's a Nintendo DS. It's got two screens. It's touch screen. Does some cool things. There's a whole bunch of patents associated to that technology. Uh, similarly, I would guess with all the other console manufacturers have different patents, and they will license them to each other if they need. You know, the Connect, like iToy, all these things had had patents associated to them. Um, so video game companies, like people making games, usually don't have patents. Um, Usually, I mean, the, the big ones will, um, but you use mm -hmm. them, they, they tend to use them as a way to protect themselves, right? Because um, basically the, the, the cool thing about patents is that the patent is, hey, I, I invented something, and so I need to explain exactly what my invention is. This is my invention, this is how it works. That is now public information. So you can then look at like, oh, that's a cool invention. I want to, uh, no, no, my patent gives me protection. I'm the owner of this. If you do anything out there that looks or does something like my patent, I can sue you and hopefully get some money. So, right. mm -hmm. so I, I get the idea of patenting hardware, right? So, are you saying also that some games have patents? The games themselves have patents. The software part does. So, so yes. I mean, certain certain things that you can do in a game, like a certain way that a game might do something, can be patented. Yeah. So, um, so, 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 like, like if you come up with a gay of uh, like you, you come up with a way of um, rendering, you know. Uh, 
the screen slightly faster in software that can okay. be patented. And that's going to be a very valuable patent because, yeah. you know. Yeah, this is where it gets tricky, especially in the context of US, the US system. So I want to say that, let's say 20 years ago, people were getting software patents for, here's this thing that happens in the real life, and now it happens on the computer. Okay, you got a patent, mm. right? Um, right. Nowadays, uh, they've changed that, so it's not as easy to get a software patent as it used to be. Um, and nowadays, generally, they tend to focus on, is what you're doing in the software, is it special to the software? Like, this isn't some replication of some process that happens outside of the software. Um, and potentially also, does it actually improve some way of the software happening? So if I invented some way to better transmit data over the internet, some sort of compression, so on, that sort of thing could presumably be patentable, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now, I want to be super clear. I'm not. I'm neither a lawyer nor a patent attorney or any of these things. Right. So this is sort of <laughs> yeah, layman. None of us are those things. Yes. So. <laughs> so this is not. You're not coming here. Yeah, there's not legal for... advice for sure. Mm, yes. Right? We're we are lay people plus, you know, we're a little bit more of, of knowledge. Um. So game companies often do get patents for certain kinds of things, and oftentimes the combination of the software and the hardware also matters, right? So if you have some, some cool thing that happens because you're doing something on a touch screen, that there might be a patent to that. Now I want to ask you, what is left out? So if you're a, you know, you're a game studio, you're making games, you know you can apply for copyright for a bunch of things or you get it automatically. You know you could you know, you get a trademark for your brand and so on. You know there's a possibility of you getting patents. What can you not get any protection for? The the idea. Right. The idea seems like the, the kind of obvious one, right? I mean, we got the right. characters the, covered. We got the specifics the of the story covered. The high concept of the game is not protected. But what about, I mean, now let's bring it back to Among Us. So what did Among Us invent, as it were? So uh, not the idea of, uh, you know, of social deduction, right? So, okay. so clearly right. not that part, right? Uh, yeah. They put it in a, in a space context, right? That okay. they're, in, they're, they're in a spaceship. Right. Right. Uh, but there are other there are other tabletop games that have already done that too. They've already done that part. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Good question. Right. So let's see. So let let's go through the elements and let's see. Uh, you know what 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 are there? Uh, they have their particular shapes to the characters. Let's say they right. have it as a right. The uh, design of those characters. Yeah. The design of those mm -hmm. characters. Right. Uh, they have. Uh, 10 characters in, in an 8 versus 2 or some sort of lesser kind of thing, 6 versus 1, however, when you add the second character. Um, they have uh, the particular way, let's say, that you, uh, the map that they have of the rooms, okay. right? And mm -hmm. the division to the rooms and the idea that you would be doing task and however exactly that works. So, uh, and all the graphics, I guess, associated with those things. Uh, right. And the tasks, the tasks are something that got sort of added that sort of real time. I'm running around doing tasks is something they added to the to the tabletop. Okay, right. Uh, genre. So for you to point out mm -hmm. their innovation, their game design innovation is perhaps taking an existing genre social deduction game. They created some interesting looking characters with nice colors and so on. They designed a map that's specific to this game. And then they added tasks. Were those tasks themselves yeah, the tasks. like, and then they and then and then they made it, you know, they and they brought it online. They brought it online. Uh, they made right. it. They they turned it into a game, into a into a video game as opposed to a tabletop game. Okay. Uh, right, with the social aspect uh, to it. And, were the tasks right. new? Like well, were these like exciting new tasks that no one had ever seen before? No, clearly no. not. <laughs> Probably not. Right? Yeah, and so here's the interesting thing that we see in in games. I think perhaps of all of of all media, it's just is like if you sit down and say, okay, how much of your game was actually like original in terms of ideas and concepts and so on? And usually it's very little, right? We, we talk about, like, well, there's a specific art and maybe the music and the map layout and everything else there was either slight improvements on things that exist other way, in other games, like, oh, they, the, the way they did movement may be slightly better or the way they handled uh, line of sight might be slightly better than as seen in another game. Everything else is always in all games, right, including Fortnite, uh, mixing and matching from other things. Uh, sometimes that mixing and matching is what's interesting. And there's entire genres of games that started off as this genre meets this new genre, and now right. they became now it becomes like a third genre. Right? Uh, we talk mm -hmm. about Metroidvania. So what is Metroidvania as a genre? Well, some <laughs> right. Um, it's 
these two words like Metroid game and Castlevania, and we combine them, and now it's like that's a whole genre. Right? And people argue right. like, is Metroid actually a Metroidvania game? Right? It's like, um, <laughs> if you think of all the new ideas that come out, they're always always building off of something else. Right? Someone saw some other game and said like, oh, I like that, but I think yep. they should have done it slightly differently in this like there's a little twist. Right? This idea of like. Game design innovation is often take something else and add a twist to it. What's your twist? Oh, my twist mm-hmm. is that you have a triple jump. Okay, maybe that's not enough of a twist. Or, no, I'm, my twist is that you, like time only moves when you're moving. Like, okay, but otherwise your game is just a first person shooter, right? And so on. And right. so, in, in that sense, um, was Epic above the bo- above the table when they basically copied what Among Us was doing? I say, well, sure. Because they were only doing what Among Us did to all these other games that came before. And all the other games that came before were doing the same to all the other games that came before that. There is very, very, very little like completely out of the blue innovation in games. In terms of game mechanics, game systems, and design. And the reason is because those are things you can't get protection for. You can't get protection for your system. You can't get protection for your mechanics. You can't get protection for your gameplay. All these, all these things are, are open. right? Um, let, 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 let me still ask, because the idea is the twist, right? So, I, I, you know, the idea, for example, of, right, you got a first-person shooter, but time only moves when, when you move, right? That seems like a really interesting, unique twist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in this case, it seems to me like, you know, um, Among Us kind of took these particular elements and put them together in a sort of way, right? Where you might say, okay, I mean... You know, having something look in a certain way is not like, uh, you know, not not that original, right? That itself wouldn't matter. And the basic social deduction genre is is already there. Fair enough. But you know, putting it uh, in a game and putting it in space and putting it with that with that particular kind of map, um, you still got, let's say, something where, you know, maybe it's the uh, putting it together in a different media that becomes uh, that that becomes the kind of an additional effort. And I know you talked about that earlier, mm-hmm. but it seems to be different than um, in Fortnite. They take that combination that Among Us kind of came up with and then import it into their world and just kind of put the Fortnite. I, it's not just that they stamp the Fortnite, you know, name on it. I mean, yeah, you know, they, they put different skins on it. Right, but mm-hmm. but isn't that a little more? Is that enough to get the the original twist on it? That's a great question, right? So, is a reskin like what is a reskin? Right, if I take Mario, um, and let's assume that I'm not going to copy any of the source code, so I'm I'm going to recreate Mario from scratch entirely. Right. So it's got all new graphics, all new music, all new sound, but everything else is exactly the same. So, like an expert Mario player would not tell the difference. So the the so that would mean the level designs were were identical as well. Right. Yes, the level designs. Would be even even though the art art was different, the level designs and like, okay, got it. Yeah. But you and just so the, coded them in in a in a different way, right? Yeah. So it's right. all my own source code. Yeah. Um, and, and let's imagine that I haven't like reverse engineered the ROM or haven't like done anything like that. Right. I've literally just like I have creatively come up with my own version of Mario, um, in my own little black box studio. And if if you then compare them, like, oh yeah, these layouts are totally the same. The mechanics are totally the same. There's something that maybe I'm, maybe my Mario doesn't launch fireballs, but he launches like spikes and they do damage and they work the same way. They bounce the same way. Like he moves the same way. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Presumably, um, I would be entitled to all the protections of the law because I created an original game essentially. Right. Um, because what the law cur- currently values is not the gameplay, is not the mechanics, it's not the systems. It's the um, the tangible visual, oral, and like it's basically the art, the music, um, and so on. Where I'm not sure right. is about the, with, with the level layouts qualify for protection. I think that's a really good, mm-hmm. like there's like a great legal case there to say like, hey, someone just reskinned this game. Um, the mechanics are all like all the same. Art is completely different. Music is totally different. But the level layouts is that enough? Um, yeah. And my and I don't know. My sense is that they would probably not be enough. Um, to qualify for protection, but I'm not sure. I think that's a that's a really good sort of. Yeah, I think that I think that Mario would have a, a serious case for preventing that that other game from being sold. 
And and notice, right, this is the legal question, but of course, you know, the right. question is, should it be that way, right? Should people just yes. be able to risk in, reskin a game? Uh, mind you, I mean, that still takes a good amount of work, right, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. we're going to program this from scratch, but not as much work as figuring out the whole idea in the first place, right, and coming up with a specific way of, of making the game work in the first place, right? Right. And, and, and in my opinion... Uh, in my opinion, if anybody does that much work to do that, they're going to make other improvements just naturally. It's going to their 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 process is you know by by recreating everything that they that they're 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 having to think about everything that has that was already created, and they're going to make improvements. So even though it might be nigh indistinguishable from the the first one. There are going to be things that that creator, the second creator, is going to say, but mine's better because of X. Because of X or Y, yeah. So if you go back to the original reason for IP, right, which is so we want society to benefit. So here's my, this is my opinion, my take, mm -hmm. and you can feel free to, to disagree. I believe that, that games are better now and games have evolved faster and and we're more exciting they're more interesting we've seen more innovation in games thanks to the fact that you can't get any kind of protection for your mechanic that you can't get any kind of protection for your system you can't get any kind of protection for your gameplay um and those are like the basic building blocks the lego blocks essentially of games someone invented jumping and someone else said that well screw that i'll do double jumping okay cool now I can take double jumping, do double jumping with a twist and double jumping with a wall and like all the kind of variations and combinations, right? And so what Among Us does is basically capitalize on that and say, yeah, you know, we have a bunch of mini games, we, which they're going to say, yeah, we invented them. Sure. But these are all ideas that we've seen elsewhere in other games, right? So in that sense, they weren't new. They weren't fresh. What was fresh was perhaps this particular combination. What was fresh, I think, was these dumpy looking characters that look kind of, kind of, kind of funny and well, hats and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so on, right? Everything else was, was not fresh. And as much as I would not be like to be in a position where I feel like some big gorilla of a company has like copied basically my game concept, essentially, um, and 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 ran with it, I sort of rec need to recognize that yeah, I'm also benefiting from all these other games that came before me. Right. Because I'm I'm just I'm just a smaller gorilla, but I'm still like I'm still going to that the the record store of you know, of, of, of game blocks and picking out like the different blocks that I wanted to use and combine them in, in cool ways. Um, you, you know, it seems to me that, I mean, my, my first reaction, you know, to, to this was like, yeah, fuck IP. Uh, right. But, but of course, <laughs> you know, that's, that just seems like maybe, you know, I, I, and notice I said, fuck IP as if we're including everything. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's interesting. The uh, the hardware patents. I mean, that stuff is really interesting. Is that I mean, I'm just curious, Jose, since we're we're dealing with the with games like Among Us, do you think the same? First of all, I guess, do you think that means that generally speaking, uh, you don't think that things like copyright protection should go very far here and I'm, I'm assuming you you do think that we need some like do, do you think let's say that characters uh need copyright protection so if i want to you know uh add any character i want to soul caliber soul caliber will now add uh, luke skywalker right uh into it and let's throw mickey mouse just for the hell of it right uh should you know, would something like this help games grow in fa even faster, right? Is there is there a point in this, these kind of traditional copyright ideas? I think that's that's the great question, is to imagine and ask ourselves, okay, what if we had less intellectual property protection in games? Um, would we see greater benefit? And maybe the answer is, is yes, right? Um, maybe there are some things that, yeah, we should be more flexible in, in allowing them to exist. And, and maybe in some cases, no. And I, I was going to say, in the in the tabletop game industry, it's quite common for publishers to publish a game under a Creative Commons license, which basically says you can do whatever you want with this. Yeah. Because they because that company itself wants to um, wants to free up the 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 community to keep creating. Yeah, and what's what's interesting there is that sometimes we see uh, companies explicitly making things open that way. Um, mm -hmm. 
and they do it even when they don't when they don't need to. So they do it in a way that gets them a lot of good PR. Um, but I could have done that with your thing anyways without your permission. It would have been fine. Is right. is often the case. So, <laughs> right. And actually, I want to remind us. So if we actually if we look at the history of games, um, games have always like. So bad practices in games, or, or games uh, practices that are considered bad. So reskinning is seen as bad. Cloning is seen as bad, right? But modding is good. And mm-hmm. modding, what is modding? Modding is basically I took something that already existed and I made some small change to it, and and that was my change. And right. for modding, we've right. gotten like historically, we know, right? A lot of people started with a mod, ended up with a d- new kind of game that then was reskinned, and now is an entire genre. Right, right, right. Um, right. We get MOBAs from real-time strategy In fact, games. That's yeah. Fortnite is is a good example of that, right? Yeah. Um, PUBG, okay. which is like the first big um, Royale game, was mm-hmm. a mod of a mod of a mod of a mod. Like it was like, like there's, a, there's a chain of mods like that led to <laughs> right. PUBG, and with other spin-offs that came out, people modded an earlier version of the mod, and so on. And so in that sense, we have seen right. in practice how games have benefited from their creators giving us tools to more explicitly like hop in and make changes, right? Um, right. So in, in the case of modding, though, you are you still have to own a copy of that software from the original mm-hmm. creators in order to modify it, in order to yeah. play the mods that other people make. You still have to own a, that, that software. So I'm still that's still a sales point for me as the original creator yeah. to say, look, I don't have to create all the content. My community will create that content for me. And I will yep. still sell more units of my software. But can I sell? A, can I create a mod of your game and sell that game? You know, as uh, as a standalone. Uh, as a standalone thing, right. once you once you once you turn it into a standalone thing, then no, right? Mm-hmm. That's a then. Why unless not? The, unless I've got <laughs> some sort of creative con, unless I've you know created some sort of because. Because it's got all of my software in it, right? No, so, so right. All, all of my code, right? right? When, when I and say, then we go back to well, it's got it's got the code which is protected, right? Right. So that, this is when we ask, you know, you know, this this is why I want to ask, and you know, it's not like I think that there shouldn't be any of these protections, but if modding has been so good, right? Uh, where's the downside? Why not just let someone, you know, uh, take take everything? Obviously, they don't have access to your code; they can't take it, right? Uh, so, um, that's just a practical problem in a sense though, right? (laughs) Where, you know, it's, if they did have access, if you had a glitch or if your game did have it and they just completely copied and pasted your code, would there be anything morally wrong with that? That's any different than just, you know, remaking your code from scratch. Yeah. It's, it's, it would be stealing your code. If you assume your code is you know the kind of property that is or the kind of thing that's worth calling a property and worth putting under uh legal protection for so, again so let's say you know, let's say i made a clay pot and then some and then you just took that clay pot right mm-hmm. that would be stealing right that but, would be stealing but here i I'm wrote not taking, code right and now so, you're just now you're just taking my code i'm just run, i'm just scanning your clay pot and running it through my 3d scanner you still it's, have your clay pot. I'm just going to have. If my I still own, have my, my clay own. pot, yeah, you still have. Then your you source haven't code. stolen it from. I have a copy of your source code. That's right. And that's one of the paradoxes mm-hmm. of intellectual property, right? Is that right. it's about, it's copying is not the same as stealing in this case, and and legally right. we could say it's it's illegal and, and and you shouldn't do it. It's not allowed, but it's not the same as stealing, right? And there's, and some people say, well, you you lose money or you lose value. It's like, well, not necessarily. Like, right. Uh, there's lots right. of case sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. It depends. I mean, it's yeah. And sometimes you even make money. Like there's there's plenty of documented cases of piracy where piracy has resulted in greater sales of the original. Um, I'm not saying this is, happens all the time. What you're sort of weighing here is how easy do we want to make it for culture to spread, for culture to change, for culture to adapt, and versus how much do we want to sort of keep it locked in, right? Um, right. I think in the case of games, you might right. say, well, maybe games have, have have hit a sweet spot where we're okay with companies have realized that there is value in letting people modify their games and do cool things with them. And then some people can take those modifications and then change other things and, and release commercial products, right? And there's plenty of examples of that of highly successful commercial games. Or, or maybe it's it's too much. And right now, perhaps perhaps where the balance is off, maybe right now too much power is in the is in control of the companies. 
and maybe not enough in the hands of the people. Because I want to ask you guys as, as a question. So we talk about level layouts in Mario. So, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a game called Super Mario Maker. And in Super Mario Maker, I'm going to make a bunch of levels. And I'm going to design these really cool, exciting, interesting levels with really new, innovative layouts. Do I own those layouts? Let's imagine, so in, in Mario, all the elements are square sprites, right? Right. Well, let's imagine I replaced all those sprites with a different artwork. Okay. And I'm an oil painter, and I make a giant oil painting, which essentially is a specific arrangement of these different sprites, which have new art, on a canvas that has certain dimensions. Um, would there be any kind of concern that I did not own the intellectual property for this painting, which I just painted? Yeah, I mean, it's a painting. I notice, right, my, our immediate yeah, reaction, say... it's a painting, it's different, because it's a painting. <laughs> so why is it different if I were to do that in Mario? Now, I'm not saying I want to own the sprites, the Mario sprites, but right. this layout, which right. I could then replace with my own artwork, with my own new right. pictures. Right. Why, why, why am I not allowed to do anything with that? Right. Why is it that Nintendo uh, says, we own your levels? Yeah, that's which a they good do. question. Which they do. They're going to say you own. They they, they own. They the do level. because of because of the, because of their function, right? Once I take it out of that function, it has a it has a totally different function. It's a mm -hmm. it's a it becomes a different thing altogether. So you know the 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 levels that I make in in Mario Maker um, can't be played. Their function is is specific to the Mario Maker. Now I might I might use Mario Maker as a way of prototyping levels for my own game. Sure. That has similar mechanics and similar things, right? And then I can go and I can just prototype these and see which ones work really well and and with the other fans because other fans can can download Mario Maker levels and play them. And I'm like, "Oh, this is great. I can I can use this as a prototyping tool." And then I go and I make these levels in my own game with my own art and my own mm -hmm. thing. And then we have a sort of more complicated question, I think does nintendo own them now that they're in my own game mm -hmm. uh yeah okay you know i i i want to i want to take a twist here because i i worry about a little being a because i feel like i'm in the weeds right now a little bit but b because <laughs> i i feel like a lot of this stuff gets uh, caught in the acceptance of here's how we do it and what exactly does this mean within the legalistic interpretation of how we're doing it when let's go back to what the whole idea was right so the whole idea was number one i want to know uh it seems to me like we need rules that are, are going to apply across the board and be consistent because it's not fair if they're not consistent but that if the idea was that we're going to do this for the good of, you know, for, for the social good, right? Mm -hmm. And notice the social good could be an economic good. It could be a cultural good, right? Yep. So I kind of sure. want to go back and kind of – we have all these – we have we have these uh, trademarks. We have these copyrights. We have these patents. With all of these, you know, maybe for each of these, which of these really contributes to the social good, right? And And maybe this idea of – Fairness for uh, I, I don't know if I want to hold on to the idea of recognizing the property itself as something being intrinsically worthwhile unless it contributes to the social good. And if we kind of get into that, right, then maybe we would have a different answers for different uh, for for different issues here, right? Ultimately, is allowing you to. Uh, own your level is that going to be the kind of thing that's ultimately going to contribute to the social good or not right now the problem is that i'm worried that if i look at this particular case or if i look at particular notice a particular case could be the mario maker case right uh mm -hmm. or it could be just levels <laughs> right um that once i give my answer to one thing maybe we're going to get a close case in some related uh, re related issue that maybe the maybe the level uh, making the own uh, allowing people to make their own levels uh, or removing copyright protection from levels altogether, right? If it's another way of putting it, maybe that will uh, be for the greater good. But then we can find something that's very very close to it, but it's not a level issue that might be necessary to protect. 
And then things seem kind of weird because a company gets, uh, I, I, or maybe they don't. Maybe it's just that we have a, we still have a rationale, and that rationale is the social good rationale. Even though from a business perspective, I don't know how it would affect things from a business perspective. There is an industry that receives very little copyright protection. And it's an industry which is hugely successful in terms of, it's an industry where you see a lot of creativity and you see a lot of innovation, a lot of changes all the time. So it's not like we sell oil and it's only oil and it's like, it's not a commodity, right? right? It's the fashion industry. Ah, okay. Oh, interesting. Right. The fashion industry, yeah. Um, the basic rationale behind that is that fashion clothing is really functional and we don't want to sort of lock down stuff that is functional. Um, so the fashion industry has very, very, very little copyright protection. Uh, trademark protection, they do have a lot of trademark protection. That is absolutely mm -hmm. uh, true. Uh, but copyright, absolutely no. And and you see this, and this is an industry which is, and so you said, well, how does this industry make so much money when someone else can basically literally knock off your designs, your like, you know, your 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 dress, your suit and the cut right. and all. Like someone else can just like knock it off, which happens all the time. Sure. And what they do is they basically said, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're an industry which is which strives and thrives on yeah this is this year's collection and next year we're going to have a new collection and if you're following fashion you're going to be interested in the new collection and the new collection the new collection right that's right. what we do as a fashion and industry and the and then the trademark is used to protect the the patterns like the the you know the Dolce Gabbana DG of, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. that they that they print on on everything right so if you're going to copy it you have to copy it without the DG yep um, and although there's still a lot of piracy about people who literally do do that as well, and that's a big problem, right? There's yep. there's a lot of problem with that. Um, yes. But that but that forces you to make some make you an, it forces you to make a, another creative choice. Mm -hmm. Like if I if I can't use this pattern of cloth, then what do what pattern mm -hmm. of cloth do I use? And that forces you to make a creative decision, which then might force other creative decisions to be made. Uh, yeah. Maybe this maybe this angle is not exactly right because I'm using this other different cloth. L l let me ask you this. Does, does it matter? So with the fashion industry, you get new designs all the time, right? Things, the time. you know, things changing. You're building on what you've got, but really it's constantly new design. Um, I'm thinking how this compares to putting $200 million into a game, right? So notice is is it the is it the amount of investment you got to put into a single product? Uh, if you put right, if if it takes that much money to put into uh, a, a single product, that is going to be like a, a really kind of big product. Then someone could just copy, right? Make a knockoff, right? So that seems so to I, be I think really I have an different. Answer. I, th it is, I think it is different, and I think it has to do with the ease at which. Um, you know, the, the amount of effort that's put into the original thing versus the ease of which a, a perfect copy can be made. Mm -hmm. You know, with fashion, um, it's, you, you're not necessarily putting millions of dollars into the original thing, although you might be. Um, but then the, the ease of which you make a copy, it also, you know, it still requires somebody to machine, you know, the, the, a sewing machine and somebody running the sewing machine, it still requires somebody to, to buy cloth. And, and so the ease of which a production is much higher. The cost of the original is much lower. Sure. And obviously there's a difference in terms of this is a physical product, right? That needs to be manufactured and these materials and, and so on versus but the design itself, I think, is the interesting part. Right? They realize like we're in a world where the design is instantly copyable by anybody, and there are other people. Like, sure, I, the only people that can copy this design are people that have you know the adequate infrastructure. Right? They'll have the people that sew, and they'll have access to the, the cloth and, and all the rest of that. And so, basically, their their avenue for innovation is well, let's just cycle through these products really fast. Um, let's also mm -hmm. stratify. Um, you won't be able to cheaply knock off my fancy Dior design that sells for $10,000 because I'm using really special kinds of materials and those materials are hard to get to, hard to work with and so on, right? I'm trading off of exclusivity. You'll knock off my super fancy design at the, the low quality material level, right? Um, you see the fashion companies also knock themselves off, right? You start to see, well, this is the, the high street version that costs $10,000, but then also there's the we have another company which happens to be owned by the big one 
that is doing mm-hmm. like the the consumer like regular street version, right? And that those are t- mm. the collections you get at Target and you know so the Macy's right. and so on, right? Um, but basically, it's always churning, always innovating, always trying. You always need to come up with some fresh idea that you that people want to have, right? You that that's what you're basically doing. Um, which we kind of have in games in the sense that there's so many games coming out there. I go in the app store and like, okay, I got 30 minutes to spare. What am I going to play? I'm going to like, someone needs to come up with something that is to catch my attention and wants to me to, you know, they want to get me to be like, oh, this looks cool. And I'm going to start training. I'm, I'm going to ignore a bunch of games by certain companies because I know they're not very good. They have a bad reputation. This company has a really good reputation for really interesting creative games and so on. Right? And we, mm-hmm. as like in the, in the, in the clones, part of the games industry we see that right you like recognize oh i can see this is a supercell knockoff right and right. it's not going to be as good because i i know that they're really good at quality control in terms of their playability and their interface and so on right their games are like top tier for that and so those i only play those i'm not going to give like some other company my 30 minutes of time right though, though yeah. it's interesting consumer trust makes a big difference consumer trust is a big deal though price point is also right so in fashion mm-hmm. right you have this kind of really big difference right and people kind of recognize the that you're getting something from a di- from a, a different degree uh but in video games it's interesting right because if i could get a, a let's say we're talking old school sixty dollar game and i get a clone of it for, for 10 bucks right and it really is a clone right uh in a very kind of similar way just about as good i might make up my mind to to get the clone but uh if we're talking about free-to-play games notice things get different at that point and that part i think is also really interesting because that's in many ways unlike other industries and in free-to-play games maybe things like reputation are particularly important because the way to monetize a game could be uh so unscrupulous uh and if you trust a company that kind of goes goes a long way and you've got nothing to lose because it's free to begin with yeah, right. I mean it, it's mm-hmm. trust and and general interest in that product, right? And there are mm-hmm. lots of other markets where there is free content, um, like the radio. Like I listen mm-hmm. to the radio, and so which channels? Are, well, I listen yeah. to the ones that have good shows that I think are interesting, that are high quality, that I learn from, and so the ones that play fewer ads, the ones that, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, the mm-hmm. g- games are not different than other markets where where there's stuff available for free, right? It's interesting also which industries we bring comparing games to, right? And, you know, it's been the publishing mm-hmm. industry, uh, the music industry, you know. Uh, fashion. Fashion. We haven't talked a whole lot about film, but obviously film is maybe the closest, right. you know, industry uh, mm-hmm. to it. Um, but really, to me, at the end of the day, we're still kind of uh, get brought back to this question of, uh, a game. What do we want from the whole thing, right? Uh, and you know, I mean, Jose has mostly convinced me that, for the most part, we want not a whole lot of <laughs> copyright protections. But I still think we want some copyright protections, right? We don't want like you know anyone to take master or do we? Do we want anyone to take master want, chief I don't and want create anybody- a game? Well, here's the thing. I don't want anybody to um, to be able to easily copy something that I have made. Right. Um, right. I don't want they be, and because because games are digital, copying is instant. Copying is pressing mm-hmm. a button. Right. That's so the whole I don't world. want because right. because it would take it because what it does is it allows whoever has the best copying and marketing machine to dominate the whole industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they can copy anything they want right. and publish it, whoever has the best, the basically the best publishing machine and copying machine basically uh, owns everything. So, so now so we're talking about literally just copying the product as a whole, not even, not even, not changing a thing, just just uh, just marketing it there. What, and and this seems closer to or, the, to or the even creating thing. a. If, yeah. Let's say you you know let's say somebody creates a whole new game. They have a game. Right. People like this, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good game, but it hasn't really caught on. But hey, Master Chief is a great character. People love him. I'm going to just take Master Chief and put him in my game. Right. So wh- why not? Well, because be- because it allows the company with the best marketing and publishing arm to dominate the industry. 
And that would, and that, I mean, so, so, and, and so therefore that actually prevents me from wanting to innovate, which goes back to the, the original question of like, do we want to, do we want to let people innovate or not let people innovate? So but here's a question. Um, is the value of Halo in Master Chief the character such that if you replace Master Chief with a different character or you pulled, would, would people not say like, oh yeah, you just took Master Chief and put him in your game, but you suck at first person shooter games. Uh, Halo is so much better. Right. Or maybe my game really is good and I just put Master Chief as a character and, you know, um, it's it's not Halo. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing, but it's kind of it's a cute, fun thing for those who liked Halo. And here's a shout out to Halo. Notice, right, at that point, you're adding something, uh, you know, um, you're adding something in terms of it's fun for uh, people to play with the character, though potentially... uh, the original creator has less incentive to create original characters or you have less incentive right. to create and people lose from that. Um, right. Maybe, right? I mean, if, that's, that's basically it. Right. If we imagine every game, instead of having to create original characters, can just borrow characters from elsewhere. But you would think eventually people just want new characters. Yeah. So then right? whoever has a new character is going to be like, oh, this person's not doing... Oh look, it's another Sherlock Holmes in my first-person shooter game, right? It's like someone has a new right. character. It's like it's cool detective. It's not Sherlock Holmes, right? Right, but that but that that novelty ends very very quickly, right? Because as soon as as soon as somebody creates a a, a new character and it's and it's free to use in every other game, yeah. every other game has that character instantly. Yeah. Though every other game won't have that character integrated. At the end of the day, though, you're still gonna want you know characters that are part of uh stories that uh really relate to those characters where those characters really that the the stories are tailored to those to those characters uh and people are going to make new characters to go with new stories to because otherwise you can't you can't to take like a well, it's, not uh, the stories. it's also gameplay too right if there's certainly less incentive for me to create a story-based game that creates new characters for other people to steal than it is for me to create a, a game that steals characters from other places. So in that sense, we could say, well, maybe games should get all the same protections for things that, let's say, music and film and, and books get, which they currently do. Which they currently do. Right. And maybe that's fine. Maybe we don't touch that. And so, but of the things that are unique to games let's say gameplay mechanics, systems, all that, they don't get any protection, which in practice, they kind of don't in many ways. And so maybe we are at that sweet spot, right? Because it's the things Mm -hmm. that are special to games are the ones that don't get any protection. Those are the ones where we see, that's where you see that explosion, right? Of creativity and innovation. We see the innovation in game design. I don't think we see innovation in narratives in games, to be honest, right? Um, Right. Mm. to, To a certain extent. And... And maybe that's okay. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a problem. A lot of people complain that well, Hollywood, yeah, it's, they're, they're always churning out the same stories and it's kind of the same characters and 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 like there's a sense of perhaps we're kind of tired uh, right. with Hollywood because but of that. There's, but there's ten percent, you know, like like the Sturgeon Law, right? Of ninety yeah. percent of everything is shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> ten. There's that ten percent, which is which are which are wonderful gems. Yeah. You know, and that's true for games. It's good true for movies. So how do we maximize um, that that ten percent? Right. Yeah. How do we make? Could we make it eleven? Could we make it twelve? And and I think That's that right. that not having protection for all these sort of game systems and ideas and, and those kinds of comps, I think, has worked really well for the industry. Um, I want to bring it back to well, what about the player? And that's where I think perhaps the players need to have more rights, as it were, to pull out those things that they might have done, like like your specific level layout that interacts a certain in a certain way that. Makes sense maybe in Mario as a Mario game, but you should be able to, you know, Mario Maker just needs an export button, like export like an XML file with like your level layout with different tags for different things, and 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 that's it. In the same way, and this goes to other games like Little Big Planet, right, or Dreams, mm-hmm. where you can create entire mm-hmm. games from scratch. These are tools essentially, uh, but it's yeah. all locked in. It's all locked into Dreams. I can't. You know, export as a separate thing, or or maybe you know, pay an extra license to export this thing. Right. When right. I write a novel, that's like, that's like Unity. Unity is basically that. It's not a game in itself, but it's a very simple game yeah. creation tool that allows you to publish games out to other things. And yeah. if you're a, if you you pay a slightly higher license for if you publish a game uh, professionally. Yes, and you pay to use the tool, 
but the company that makes the tool doesn't own what you make with it. Microsoft does not own right. the novel I just wrote in Microsoft Word. Right? Right. They don't own uh, Adobe, doesn't own whatever I did in Photoshop. Right? So why does Media Module own the game I made in Dreams? Why does mm. Nintendo own the, the level well, because the sequence micro, of special Microsoft, levels that I made? Microsoft doesn't own, doesn't own the language. Mm-hmm. Right, but that but Mario Kart can't be played. A Mario a, a Mario a, a, a Mario Maker level can't be understood by any other software. So the language is specific. It but owns that's by, that's by design. You know, Nintendo owns the language, right? Oh, absolutely by design, right? Sure. I, I think with this way, Microsoft Word doesn't own the language, but they own their file format, right? And they've added tools that let me export to other types of other formats that are open and accessible. Right. But Microsoft Word could be different, right? They could say, well, you can only read this novel in Microsoft Word. And now everybody needs to buy a copy of Microsoft Word to read your novel. And that's the only way we're, right. we're going to allow your novel to get out there, which is what mm -hmm. Nintendo does. And, and that's what Nintendo does. And, 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 they, and they toyed with that in the 80s. <laughs> I mean, there was, I mean, it was, it was, it was a, a problem, right? People were, were trying to export you know their work and couldn't because somebody didn't have exactly the the same software. Yeah, um, it was a problem. Well, and we realized the society benefits mm. from not having that locked in. Right? Well, and, and the companies right. also realize like, uh oh, we're going to lose our business case here, right? If someone else's format becomes the dominant format, I'm hosed, right? So the rest like, okay, right. I'll open up my format. I'll let other people access it. Uh, Adobe does that with PDFs and text files and so on. So they recognize that openness is important, and I. I think sort of the games industry should start to. I would like to push the games industry to go in that direction somewhere, right? Yeah, right. that's that's yeah, really I interesting. Agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Though, though, you know, to 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 me, it's 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 uh, it's really interesting how, you know, Microsoft the utility of of something like Microsoft Word is just so different than the utility of a game. Uh, if you want something to be specifically the way you want it to be, right? You're going to have to have it within a particular framework. Though maybe there is a lot to say about do we really need to have everything in different frameworks and can we have this compatibility that Jose is talking about uh, as kind of uh, you know a desirable uh, way to be and and even if you're not getting like you know the you know the the big companies of the world to kind of agree on this um, is it possible to have some sort of uh, you know a Creative Commons platform? kind of situation where people are thinking ahead of time about something like this. I think it's... Uh, and I think there are a lot of people are talking about the metaverse right now, and that's mm -hmm. specifically what they're talking about. Mm. Yeah, sort of an open open format environment that everybody can participate. I mean, we just look at the web. Like, the web right. comes out of, here's this open format, here's the rules for how to connect to it, and this is basically how it works. And then all of a sudden, like, the internet explodes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and games have exploded. I think they could explode even more. If we sort of recognize... As, so companies have recognized, and I think as, as the players have, have been perhaps too shy about this, is to recognize that, yeah, you know, game design innovation happens, 99% of it happens at the grassroots level. It happens at the fan who makes like a little tweak here, a little tweak there, who mixes and matches a couple of things that hadn't, didn't think they would go together, and they do, and that gets us some attention. The whole modding community, like that is where this all happens. It's not even so much the indie space. It's the, the modding community plus sort of this indie mentality of innovating, creating new kinds of games. Um, and I really hope that uh, the industry as a whole sort of recognizes that, like, you know what, we've we've been successful because people have been able to like, mix and match many of our ideas and many of, of our concepts. And uh, we will continue to be even more successful the more we open those gates. Right? If we make modding easier, that opens more gates. Mm -hmm. If we let people export things from our games and, you know, finding the right balance between, like, export what it is you're exporting, but let people export more things, it's better. If you allow for more interoperability, that's better. Like all these things, I think can only take the industry forward. And fundamentally, I think there's a moral question there. Right? I think is the morally right thing to do. Right? It's to it's to think of this as this is for the greater good of society. If of all of us together, we benefit from more games, better games, more innovation games, and so on. All That's right. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you very much, okay. Jose. <laughs> good podcast, Jose. Good podcast, Andy. Uh, GP. GP man. GP. All right. <laughs>